on today's episode of Cheating When Love Lies. To forgive or not to forgive, that is the dilemma. When your spouse or partner betrays you not only once but twice or more. When the betrayal is ongoing with frequent hookups, titillating sexts and DMs, then the ultimate, carnal, rapacious intercourse with a lover. Can you ever truly forgive or truly forget? On this episode, I'll address the notion of forgiveness after an affair in a short fictional story I've written and will narrate called To Forgive or Not to Forgive. That is the dilemma. After the reading, I'll host a roundtable discussion with my diverse group of guests, Kenny, Melissa, and Sandy, all from different backgrounds with differing points of view about cheating and affairs. My guests will react to the story and share their own thoughts on infidelity. Thank you so much to all the listeners. I really appreciate it when you share the podcast, like, and most of all, leave comments. Please do it because the star ratings really, really help me. And I'd love to hear from you. So let's get started. To forgive or not to forgive, that is the dilemma. People said she had a special aura about her. I think it was a halo. Talk about the perfect wife? Well, this was it. She wasn't a powerhouse like her sister, a high-powered finance ball buster. She didn't have all the pomp and circumstance that looks really good on a LinkedIn profile, enviable accomplishments like sitting on boards and best-of recognition plaques. She was an impeccable wife and mother. She went to good schools, the right schools, that qualified her as educated, high-class, and sophisticated. She was smart and had the credentials to prove it. Anyone who doubted her intelligence changed their minds after her comments like, Choate really cultivated my love for learning, or Princeton really prepared me for that. She'd say things like this in a conversational and unpretentious way, as part of her normal, everyday conversation. She was incredibly giving and thoughtful, so much so that it made you feel inadequate. She didn't mean to, but no matter what you said or did to demonstrate your kindness and sensitivity, she'd one-up you and put your paltry little volunteer day at the nursing home to shame. Naturally beautiful, she came from a lineage of top models and attended to her appearance in ways her husband liked. She had big boobs and a conservative yet tight wardrobe that likened her to a sexy nurse in a porno video, buttoned up with just enough peekaboo to arouse. Millennials, feminists, and others might criticize her for coming off like a Stepford wife, but every woman I know out here in the burbs, with two or more kids, two or more dogs, two or more homes, and two or more husbands, sequential, not concurrent, of course, thought she was the bomb. The moms and I would ask ourselves, how does she do it? My friend and her husband invited me to spend time with them at their perfectly decorated vacation home in the Hamptons. When I arrived, I found a welcome note on the door with some poetic onomatopoeia and a hand-drawn smiley face with a heart. My friend was out in the back playing tennis, so she couldn't give me what she referred to in her note as a, quote, proper welcome. I heard some clapping and high fives, then her voice say, Hey, good game. Your serve and volley almost got me. She was appeasing her opponent because she just crushed him in the match. I walked into the kitchen past a vase of freshly picked flowers she'd grown in her garden. There was vegan chili cooking on the stove, and her sourdough bread and chicken pot pie were in the oven. I walked toward the tennis court, and she threw her arms up in the air and gave me a big pre-corona era type hug. Her hair was slicked back into the perfect pony, and her tennis outfit was the latest and greatest. I noticed that her legs weren't perfectly shaven, and secretly I was like, yes, strike one. I loved her to death, but I'd only been there five minutes, and already she was making me feel like a bum. We sat down at a little cafe table by the courts and just started to talk. We were best friends, so there was never any need for lead-up. We could just jump right in. He had an affair, she said, in a way that was so matter-of-fact, it's like she could have been talking about her neighbor, her sister's husband, or someone else. Who? I said. Doug, she said. Doug had an affair. 
her husband's name was Doug, her tennis partner's name was Doug, and her life coach was also named Doug. Her expression was so matter-of-fact, her revelation so abrupt, the idea of it being her husband Doug seemed impossible. So I said, Which Doug? She lowered her head and tried to speak, but the words couldn't come out. She never actually answered the question. Doug, Doug? I said. I can't believe it. He adores you. There's no woman Doug could possibly want more than you. I saw a teardrop on the table confirming that it was in fact her Doug. Her Doug of 26 years, who was generous, a great provider, a doting father, loving friend, and neighbor. He was a respected and successful architect. He was handsome, smart, and rich. I didn't want to admit it, but in a town where midlife divorcees were looking to write Chapter 2 with a man who was handsome, smart, and rich, the idea of Doug having an affair was actually quite plausible. And this isn't the first time, she added. Holy crap, I slumped back in my cafe chair. Her face was swollen and puffy, but she still looked gorgeous, even more beautiful in her vulnerability and longing. Doug's mistress was a 45-year-old divorcee who was smart enough, cute enough, and nice enough. Doug and the divorcee did it once in the pool house he was renovating on her property, and she used that lay to forge a relationship via text and DM. The divorcee sent him sweet, sexy notes flattering him, complimenting him, and luring him over. Their time together was carefree and exciting. With her, he wasn't the responsible husband and father. He was a wild and sexy stud. Doug never planned to have this affair. He saw the first time as a whoopsie-daisy, but the divorcee made having the affair so easy, he just kept going. At first, it was just making out an oral, so he rationalized it as cheating light. After a few times of that, it progressed to full-on sex, and they rocked it. Her on top, him on top, crisscross, doggy style— for Doug, it was a great activity, a fun, titillating something to do with a nice lady in the neighborhood. He didn't need some big philosophical reasoning or childhood trauma to explain why he was doing this. It was his side gig. He thought, doesn't every guy have one from time to time? But soon the divorcee started talking about how she and Doug could be together, start over, and write chapter two. He remembered one day after sex saying something like, I'm loving this which easily could have been misconstrued as I'm loving you. He started to feel suffocated as she became more demanding of his time and attention. Initially, the affair made Doug feel happier and more, quote, alive again. It was nice while it lasted, but he was ready to move on. The divorcee got angry when he broke it off and she threatened to expose their affair, but Doug refused to live in fear of being outed, so he decided to confess to his wife. This way, he could control the narrative and soften the impact of what he had done. He would also tell his wife that he loved her, that the affair was fun but meaningless, and that he hated himself for causing her pain. Tell me everything, my friend said to Doug in that matter-of-fact tone. Please, don't hold back. Doug knew she meant it. He knew his wife, and he knew that she would listen and forgive him. He told her the divorcee wasn't the first time— but the only other time was with a woman named Angela back when their eldest was in rehab. She was just a distraction from all that stuff, he said, talking as though Angela didn't count and he could just delete her from his ledger of sins. My friend reached for the bottle of Pouillet Fusée and poured more into my glass and then into her own. There was caviar and creme fraiche. I looked under a napkin in a basket on the table, expecting to find warm bellinis to go with the caviar and creme fraiche. The basket was empty. Oh, no, my friend said. I forgot to get bellinis. Strike two, I said to myself, ashamed that I was still thinking about my own inadequacies in the face of her pain. Oh, I'll tell the housekeeper to go get some for cocktails tonight, my friend said. We sat and talked for hours about Doug men, life, and what was next for her marriage. Doug was right. My friend had forgiven him. She forgave him because she loved him. She forgave him because except for this affair, everything in her life was just how she wanted. 
With love, persistence, and determination, she created her perfect life. She refused to allow anything to threaten her family or her self-identification with perfection. She saw her world as the quintessence of everything. The affair marred that perception, but she would make her marriage whole again with forgiveness, patience, and love. At 5.30 sharp, Doug rolled up to the house looking rugged and sexy in his loud four-by-four with wicked rims. He was carrying a white box, a bottle of Dom, and a pack of Blaney's. He walked into the kitchen and hid the box behind his back as if we couldn't see it, then whipped it out and yelled, surprise, like a 12-year-old boy at a birthday party. He gave me a welcoming and sincere, hey, it's so good to see you. But his attention was toward his wife. He was leaning in to kiss her. He pulled back from the kiss, held her hand and said, I love that dress, honey. I bet it will go well with this, he said, shaking the box in front of her. I walked away to give them privacy while she opened the box. There was nothing inside that box that could have been more beautiful, valuable, and desired than what he had already given her, his truth, his heart, and his soul. I went into the bathroom and shut the door. I sat down and did my thing, then reached for the toilet paper and, <gasps> there was none. Strike three, I said, knowing that none of this truly mattered, even missing toilet paper in the age of corona. <laughs> <laughs> Today I'm welcoming my friends and guests, Sandy, Kenny, and Melissa. So is this wife a rock or is she a martyr? I don't think she's either. Oof. I think she's comfortable in her life. She appreciates her life. Her life is who she is because she's not a big career woman. It's her confidence. It's her ego. And the affairs rocked her, but she's more solid about her life in it than without it. Okay. Do you agree with that, Melissa? Well, I love how you open up the story because she's introduced as a perfectionist. And Brene Brown talks about how perfectionism is a shield mm. to vulnerability. Oh. And I feel like she may not be aware of it yet. But it will eventually, like, break down how she may feel about herself. So if she co-signs his behavior, is he comfortable co-signing if she decides to have a tryst? Is she allowed that? Well, you don't want to know. I think everybody knows how <laughs> I feel about that. I'm an I, eye for I eye kind of girl. Cerebral is an online mental health service that offers prescription medication, counseling, and therapy for anxiety, depression, ADHD, insomnia, and more. Not only do they offer medication, they deliver it straight to your door. Just this past weekend, I went to the pharmacy to pick up medication, just like my best friend. We both did this. And we had the same experience. We drove all the way to the pharmacy, and either the medication wasn't ready or the pharmacy was closed. With Cerebral's convenient delivery service, this will never happen to you because Cerebral is one of the few services that provides prescription medication online through a licensed provider and ships medication straight to your door. And you can coordinate all your counseling sessions through your laptop or on the Cerebral mobile app. Now, how convenient is that? And the price is phenomenal. It's less than one-third the price of traditional therapy. With 75% of patients reporting feeling better in just 60 days, plus its convenience and affordability, why wait to get Cerebral? And for listeners of this program, you can receive 65% off your first month of medication management and care counseling at GetCerebral.com slash cheating. Go to GetCerebral.com slash cheating for 65% off your first month. That's just a total of $30 to get started. Join Cerebral today on their mission to make quality mental health care accessible and affordable for all. But is she a rock or is she a martyr, Kenny? I mean, a rock in terms of the fact that she's staying in the marriage even <clears throat> after he confesses to her about this affair. I, I wouldn't call her a rock, just a flawed human being like everyone else. Hmm. So we hear about these people that stay with their husbands. Some people shame them. Some people understand who supports this woman in staying with the guy and who doesn't among you? Who accepts that she's staying with the husband? 
Uh, I don't think it's a matter of accepting her. I just, uh, the writing was on the wall because she's a super well-educated woman whose marriage and family and 26 years of raising children has defined her. So how does that put the writing on the wall? What about that says, oh, he's going to have an affair? No, no, it doesn't say that he's going to have an affair, but it says that if she were to not accept it, her life to her is going to be horrible because everything that defines her life is wrapped up in Doug, the marriage, and the 26 years of And according to Melissa and in her perfectionism? It seems like she just accepted it. Oh, why do you say that? Because she's – she. It happened twice, right? At least, right? Mm-hmm. Right, that we know of. <clears throat> and she probably weighed the pros and cons of leaving mm-hmm. versus. That's why I said perfection is actually kind of boring. I think he's really? cheating. Yeah, it is for a guy. Oh, tell me about that. Yeah, it's just it is. I mean, the divorcee, right? Is, yes, is not perfect, right? She's divorced, right? right. That's like okay. in, in this world, not perfect. But right. it was probably more exciting for a moment because. It's it's actually boring to be with someone who's perfect in a perfect relationship. Okay, I know you're married, but you wouldn't want a gorgeous <clears throat> woman who's brilliant, who takes great care of your kids Doesn't and is nurturing. For, for a man, there's there's not gorgeous enough anyway, because oh. Oh. because men are like hunter gatherers. So like, if you are going to at different stages of your life, right? You get older, and right. I'm not saying I don't. But okay, people, you cheater. Do. Yeah, right, I get older. <laughs> yeah, like you get one perfect woman. Yeah, you want to be able to get two or three or four or five. You got to be able to prove to yourself as a hunter that you can go out and kill more prey or whatever. Right, capture more babes. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's funny because my next question was: if she was perfect and the mistress was just enough, how do you explain that, Melissa? Do you agree with Kenny? I just it, the thing is with infidelity it has nothing to do with the other person it has to do with the person cheating and how they feel about themselves because a lot of men who do this mm-hmm. either it's an ego trip in numbers or it's an ego trip in filling a bottomless pit of a hole that needs to be dealt with with therapy mm-hmm. I mean, you Google, like, top actresses that have been cheated on. They are the most beautiful, successful women in the world. Mm -hmm. No one is exempt from this. It has to do, for me, in my mind, with childhood trauma, with Mm -hmm. lack of connection, Mm -hmm. lack of integrity, people leading with their egos and not really doing work to have a deep connection where they are vulnerable. Would you apply this to both men who cheat and women who cheat? Absolutely. Okay. So it's the same narrative according to you, for both. I agree. Okay. Uh, The friend says, um, there's no woman he could want more than you. The wife was beautiful, smart, loving, and nurturing. Does having these qualities as the wife lessen the possibility that her husband will cheat? Melissa, you answered that, but I'd like to hear from Sandy. No, I agree with Melissa on that. I think that, um, that Doug has insecurities his first affair was when the marriage was struggling with a child that yes. had, had mm-hmm. difficulty. Mm-hmm. So he was insecure. Angela, the first affair was probably a Band-Aid on a big gash wound that he felt mm-hmm. as a failing father, mm-hmm. failing parent. And, of course, he accepted it. It was easier because it was the second. Consecutive affairs get easier and easier. You just sort of somehow manage to find a way to say this now, is okay. Now, why do you think that? I just think historically, if you've had one affair, the second one is easier, the third one is is easier because you're like, it becomes... You give yourself permission. Correct. Okay. Is Correct. that true, Kenny, that it gets easier? I don't know. I've never cheated, really. Oh, come on. I don't believe it. No, really. I, I, I don't... Come on. No, I, I, I would say this. I am I am really too honest sometimes. You could even ask my wife. Sometimes mm-hmm. I'm probably almost on the verge of mean. But if I were to have cheated it would have been the type of thing where it was like we're broken up for whatever kind of knowing that i would get back together with a person okay well that's cheating because it's like it's it's premeditated yeah but it was also kind of like hey we're not together too so i know yes that that was kind of like the rationale of what Doug's rationale was like Mm -hmm. okay i i have problems in my life and for me you know earlier it was more like me and my ex at the time were on and off for six years okay so it'd be like we'd get into a huge heated argument which Uh is again probably more exciting than just being Uh you know 
being perfect, right? Yeah. There's some drama. It's it's yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I grew up with like a lot of drama like that. Right. Too. Okay. Join the club. Yeah. So it was like, okay, we're not together. And we were probably not together for two months, mm-hmm. kind of knowing that we'd get back together, but we were. Right. We're in, but did you tell her? Lady, oh, I plan on sleeping with other people. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then you're not cheating. I guess not. But but again. Well, I'm saying God. you're not, but you're kind of thinking that you are. A little bit because, because I would why? say that knowing that I would probably get back together uh-huh. with the person too. You took or advantage she, of the situation. Yeah, but she would too, probably. I just feel like fair is fair. You guys have to be in alignment. When you're in a relationship with someone, you need to be in alignment. The game needs to be written. You need to exchange what your plan is. And you guys need to be on the same page. There are people who are in open relationships. Yeah. It's not for me. Mm-hmm. My father, my biological father, mm-hmm. is the product of an affair. Oh. My mother remarried a man who cheated aggressively. <laughs> Tell me about your father who's the result of an affair. Does he internalize that in some way? Absolutely. The self-worth is below the floor. It's in the basement. It's not something that he's even aware of. Who cheated, his mother or his father? So my grandfather was married with five children. Okay. And met my grandmother and had an additional three. Okay. One of which is my father. I miss that. <laughs> My grandfather was married to another woman. Okay. He had five children with her. Yes. And then he had an affair with your grandmother. Correct. And had your father. Correct. Okay. Did he end up marrying or connecting in a partnership with your grandmother? On the weekends. (laughs) Oh, wow. He's Mac Daddy. It is so unfortunate that my grandmother participated in the emotional abuse of a wife. How did this affect your father, in your opinion? Um, it affected his self-worth. It affected his relationships. He How? became Be codependent. Specific. He became a um, shapeshifter in relationships. What's that? So he, uh, he was engaged, I think, four or five times. Right. And he was constantly reinventing himself with new hair, new clothes, the music that he listened to. He was just trying to be accepted. Did he feel, quote, unquote, illegitimate? Absolutely. Uh huh. Absolutely. Right. Because this is siblings. back in the day. Yeah. Right? He had siblings. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. My father's, you know, almost in his seventies right. now. It's not the same now. Absolutely mm-hmm. not. Mm-hmm. But it's still um, harmful, you know, because th- as far as they were concerned, him and his siblings, they were trying to justify their existence. Oh my gosh! How has this impacted you? Um, I think it's given me a great perspective on integrity and. Um, treating people kindly in relationships. I know there's a big kindness train out there in the world. Is it really possible? Do we not have desires and needs that need to be fulfilled for ourselves that may just hurt other people and therefore could be perceived as unkind? Right. I'm married to you, Kenny. I have an affair. Good luck. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Because I come from a background like Melissa's father. It's nothing against you. It's about my own deficits. Does that make me unkind or just flawed? I think you need to be in communication with your partner about your needs. Mm -hmm. And if you need to date, I mean, think about the men that are in their 60s that are very busy dating lots of different women. It exists. Just be, be... Honest with yourself about your needs, your wants. If you want to date nine women at once, then just make sure they know about it. Because the thing is, I truly believe that we exchange energy when we're having a sexual encounter. Yes. And when you are passing that energy along to someone who did not Mm co-sign, that's where it becomes wrong. The story talks about cheating light. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier, Kenny, um, that you would cheat when you were, quote unquote, on a break with a girlfriend. So maybe it wasn't really bona fide cheating. It was cheating light. We often talk about this on the show. Are there various degrees of cheating or the emotional deceit at the core of any affair, no matter how it manifests, via texting, via DM, sex romps? Whatever which way it manifests, is it all the same, Sandy? 
Yes, I think it's all the same. I think that people define it. And when he, when Doug says, oh, you know, it wasn't really sexual intercourse, it wasn't real sex, he's just preparing himself to defend himself when he's judged by somebody else, whether it's his wife or anybody else. Oh, it wasn't really real. It wasn't really that serious. It wasn't really that significant. Mm -hmm. It started out and it was just oral sex. It wasn't really real. It's just the guilt, the person having the affair who somehow manifests in his mind or her mind oh, it, you know, it wasn't intercourse. Somehow that's going to be significant when they share it with their spouse right. or well, their partner. I was in a relationship and it was supposed to be monogamous. I sleep with you, you sleep with me, you know, everything's going fine. And then one day I find out, you know, he's having oral sex with other women. I'm like, wait a minute, aren't we supposed to be monogamous? Well, I didn't have intercourse. Right. There you go. I mean... I'm just wondering if the shoe was on the other foot, if he if you let him know, oh, I'm so glad that you shared that with me because I'm also having oral sex with other men. Right. <laughs> How that would go. Well, he's a man. I don't think he can. <laughs> do you know, but do you know what I mean? Like, yes. uh, yeah. yeah. How's that going? Yeah. How Kenny, is that? How is that? Well, I mean, I, I've definitely witnessed like the there's the what is the double standard of, of right. that, you know, but in uh, that from per- from guys to girls. But, you know. The, the whole cheating thing is it's like it's interesting because I was looking at your questionnaire and it's like, why do men cheat? And it's like, well, why do people cheat? Why is it so associated? Like it's always associated that the guy's the one cheating. But I don't think that way. Uh, I no, no. It was just the way, way it was written. OK. It was like written. And I was like, hey, man, it's okay. not just guys that cheat. So but, how do you know that? Do you have an experience with somebody, a woman that cheated on you? Um, yeah. But also I, <clears throat> my my mother was cheated on and hmm. – cheated in return Mm. retaliatory cheating yeah as far as i know i mean Mm -hmm. i was i was really young Mm -hmm. so how did that impact you or how Um, do you feel that has impacted you now that you're a man with a fantastic wife yes and great children yeah well i i kind of made a choice that i i really didn't want to do that i didn't really want to go behind someone's back that's why i was even honest like when i like i said these kind of breaks and stuff like that for me it was just i'd rather be honest you were kind of sort of honest <laughs> i feel like i was yeah yeah i i feel like it was maybe honest to the person and a little bit deceitful to myself oh you know what i mean i like that you know i like like that, oh this is Jimmy. over you know this I is like over that. but uh-huh. kind of knowing that like it's not really over uh-huh like, you know until it finally was i like that because it really it does dovetail with what you're saying, Melissa, it comes back to you, right? Usually these circumstances have very little to do with the person you're cheating with, but it's all about your own deficits, your own vulnerabilities and insecurities. And you're just going to, you know, parlay that into this relationship. It could be Bob, Steve, or John. Well, I'm heterosexual, so in my case, it would be a man, right? It's it's you're just putting that on the other person. Right. And I think that these happenings are a great opportunity for you to work on your own childhood wounds, Uh right? To work on the unworthiness, right? Because it's not about the weight. It's not about being successful. It's not about the car you drive. It's not about your hair. It's not about, you you know, they decided to start seeing you for a reason. And if Uh your expectations were that you were going to be monogamous with me, if that was a discussion that Uh was had, you're going to be upset. Why? Because someone didn't tell the truth. Great. You're a liar. Let's move on with my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not so easy. Well, not when you're, you know, in it. Not when you're in it. And she's really into the lifestyle. Right. Did anybody blame her for that? I was more bothered by the gift giving. Okay, let's go. In exchange for her personal integrity. What do you mean? When he gave That's her the gift at the end? Oh, absolutely. But by then they had reconciled. Can he give her a gift? They've reconciled. No, the gift is in exchange. But how can you say that when she knew about the affair, she either accepted and or forgave him. Now they're moving forward. He's giving her a gift. Yeah, I think the gift is just part of their lifestyle. Yeah. She probably, you know, he shows up with Bellinis. She'd forgotten the Bellinis. <gasps> oh, I love the Bellinis. She's, but I think she's saying that, that their lifestyle is an exchange. Right. Right. It's, right. It's all sounds like an exchange right. at some level. Like she right. wants the perfect image. So yeah. she'll settle for everything else. Like that's like that's the price to pay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't get the sense that that was a gift. Uh, an I'm sorry, gift. I didn't. I thought that was just sort a genuine of, gift. I mean, uh, my wife's best friend came out from the Hamptons. I'm going to come home with something nice. I thought the Bellinis were really interesting 
because it suggested to me that Doug was paying attention, right? It wasn't just about the gratuitous gift giving. He was really paying attention. It was symbolic of his wanting to be participant in the everyday needs of his wife's life. But as, felt- as an entitled, sexy, successful man, yeah. I have not only the opportunity, but the ability and the wanting to carry out extramarital affra- affairs, whether or not that hurts my wife or not. So let's go there. Does the fact that he's good-looking, smart, and rich make him different than other men who are not but still cheat? Yeah. He's got like the triumvirate of allegedly what people want. Yeah. I'm good-looking, so I'm he's smart, got the, and rich. he's got the boring, perfect thing too. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. Sandy? Um, are you going to eschew all the smart, rich, good-looking men running after you? I think he's going to defend the fact that – the affair is helping him be a better husband. Tell me about that. I think that he's going to, in his own mind, and probably if his wife pushed, he would say, it's not distracting from my relationship with you at all. It's, you know, mm. I'm, I'm still just, I'm still there, if not more there. Right. They say that men cheat to stay and women cheat to leave. So that theory would align with what you're saying. Yeah. Is that true, Kenny? If Um, I can have an affair and something on the side, it gives me the ability to stay home and be the patriarch and do all the things that I'm supposed to be as a good father and husband. Does it make it easier? It's case by case, I would Mm say. Mm -hmm. Like, I was kind of... In my situation I was talking about before, I was kind of trying to find someone else to leave, I feel like. Did you feel like you needed another relationship as your excuse to get out? Yeah, I think so. I think it was like like trying to find the nail in the coffin. Okay. If that makes sense. Okay. Like, okay, this this is now closed. This chapter is now closed. I've done something that I can't return from. Okay. Yeah, I act like that in my life in general. Mm-hmm. If I'm not sure what to do, I'm going to do something – so volatile, bam, there's no coming back. Yeah. I don't like doing that anymore. Mm. What's my problem, Melissa? <laughs> I like the drama. High drama. Aligned. I get it. You know, sometimes we end up with someone who um, creates the volatile um, situation that we had when mm. we grew up. It feels familiar. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Doug qualified his affair as a whoopsie daisy. Can the compulsion to have an affair be sudden and unforeseen? Or is there this latent desire to screw around that's simply waiting for an opportunity? Sandy. No. I I think the whoopsie is pretty accurate. I think it can come from all sorts of angles. And I think it would be very rare for somebody to conscientiously say, I'm going out to look for an affair. Oh, really? I disagree with that. Oh, I don't. I think that affairs happen bass backwards. You're, it's an old friend. It's a rekindled friend. It's a – I don't think it's a premeditated um, – I mean I'm sure it can be, but for the most part, I don't think it's a premeditated thing. I don't think Doug went out to find either of his affairs. As a matter of fact, I'm concerned that the second affair is going to be a really hard one to leave behind. I think she's going to keep – knocking on his door. Well, but he blew her off. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. Well, she's divorced and she's got the hots for him and okay. she pushed to begin with. She's going to keep pushing. Really? Do you agree with that, Melissa? Well, do you agree with the fact that the divorcee is going to keep pushing and do you agree with what Sandy's saying that affairs are really sudden and you didn't see it coming and it quote unquote just happened? I think it's a little fucking middle school. That's oh. what I think. Okay. Um, it, it, you know, when you're 16, sure. Yeah. When you're married with children, you better get your shit together. Go see a therapist. No. When you're looking at, like, the stories on Facebook of, like, some ex, that's like, hello, look at yourself. Any any flirting, I'm smelling a story in here. What happened? Uh, no. Just in general. Like, what are you mm-hmm. doing? What are you doing? When you are at a client's home, let's just say that she was married. You're at a client's home and you're going to potentially screw up 
future clients with the fact that you're now screwing so-and-so's wife? Well, I don't think you're screwing it up because in the affair, there's this unwritten rule of secrecy, right? You're not expecting that the other person's going to divulge. With ego moves. Oh, here we go. With the ego moves. With this guy who is very much into himself, to Mm -hmm. the fact that he's having multiple affairs on a woman who is wonderful and amazing. Um, Getting attention, I'm sure, lights him up. I mean, I think he said that he was, it made him feel alive. Yes. But so sure, people oopsie say, daisies. Say, mm-hmm. Sure. Oopsie daisies. Let's see what, it, what it's like when he's at the receiving end of this kind of behavior. How oopsie daisies is it? Well, you said it was like sixth grade, implying that it's this sudden impulse and you just can't control it and that's wrong. I don't necessarily agree with your opinion, Melissa, or yours, Sandy, I think that there's this latent, like, desire to find something else. And it's just kind of brewing, and it's sitting there in your internal oven, and when that opportunity happens, you're traveling, or your wife is away, or it's the wife that's you know, has this latent desire. She's traveling for her job, she's away, she's at the hotel, oh, there's so-and-so that I see at every convention twice a year. Boom. Emotional immaturity. Emotional immaturity. You would right? never want that to go down for yourself. You would never wish that on yourself. Is that true? Is that emotionally immature or just the way life goes, Kenny? Um, what aspect being emotionally immature? I don't know. Ask Melissa. Melissa, what aspect uh, was were you mainly uh, referring to as far as being emotionally so immature? So if you have signed a contract, a marital contract, stating that you are monogamous – and you decide decide to step out of that. I think it shows your lack of empathy in being on the receiving end of your person having a physical relationship with someone. Well, but you're not thinking that when you're screwing the other person. Let's say it's a woman. She's having an affair on her husband. She's not thinking, oh, gosh, I wonder how my husband's going to feel. She's thinking about her own Apparently, according to you guys, sudden impulse to express herself outside the marriage. I would say that their boundaries are messed up hmm. or or at least they haven't been examined to be even put in a situation to have a physical relationship with someone outside of your relationship. I think that the whoopsie daisy for Doug was, oh, my gosh, I had that oral sex with her and then it ignited this whole series of events that was the whoopsie daisy. Like I never intended for this to happen. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. I agree. Okay. I agree. Um, Doug doesn't seem to stay in this affair too long. He talks about the time when it became less titillating and more like a chore. What do you think turns the affair from titillating to more like a chore, Sandy? Oh, definitely the divorcees uh, pushing more than he wants because she's – basically single and free and available Mm. and he is still sneaking around corners and it's a full-on affair Mm -hmm. so the imbalance is is prodigious yeah and it's you know it it it, even if even if doug trusts her a hundred percent it is not a he doesn't feel good about the fact that she because she's so available and so free that she could just show up at his doorstep at any point uh, Kenny, do you agree with that? What turns an affair from titillating to more like a chore when the woman or the man who's cheating is going to be like, you know what, I'm done? What's the turning point? I don't know because I haven't really, like I said, I haven't really been in that situation. Don't you have either. a friend that's had an affair? <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I feel like any person that i've known that has an affair it's like one of those types of things they're like more into the excitement and drama of it mm. so becoming a chore is like one of those things actually i don't you know i guess maybe boredom possibly where i don't what I are don't, they bored of they get bored of the sex they get be. bored of the routine of yeah. having to sneak around what are they bored of melissa well i think to initiate it you're looking for a fantasy right yeah. so she broke the fantasy Therefore, it's not fun anymore. What was the fantasy for the for the uh, divorcee? She broke what fantasy? Well, 
she broke his fantasy, which made him uninterested. What, in your opinion, was his fantasy? I'm not sure. I don't have enough information, but it was enough to get him interested. Um, Okay, well, the excitement, Mm -hmm. the spontaneity, um, the fact that, who knows? It could have been something she was wearing. Who knows? As simple Maybe as that. she was suggestive. Mm-hmm. He was he was available in the moment. Who knows? For me, it was the minute she wanted to get married. He's like, goodbye. Yeah, exactly. I <laughs> right? agree. Yes. I'm not going to change my lifestyle, yeah. uproot my wife and kids for this. Yeah. Well, there are consequences for his divorce, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. After his mistress threatens going to his wife... Doug ends up confessing his affair. He didn't want to live under the threat of the mistress blowing up his relationship at home. He wanted to control the narrative. What are your thoughts, your own thoughts, on why he confessed? And did he do the right thing by doing so? And could you ever do that if you got caught cheating, Sandy? Oh, I think he totally was covering his bases. And I think it's pretty typical behavior. There's just an imbalance. Did he do the right thing by telling his wife? Uh, The only reason he did the right thing by telling his wife is he in his own mind felt that it was probably safer to tell her than for uh, her to find out another way. The fear of the unknown? Uh, No, the fear of how she would find out, either because the divorcee approached her directly or the divorcee had a mutual friend or somehow she found out in a way that wasn't from Doug. And that he would be concerned about how she would receive it or that he would be concerned about himself being caught as opposed to being honest? Him being honest, quote unquote, honest with his wife is the only way in his mind eye that she should be receiving the information. It's like a selfish thing. Well, because otherwise, who knows how the story is going to go. He can design the story and create the story any way he wants and just say, oh, it it wasn't really that serious or it was only oral sex or it was whatever. Whereas if it comes Mm. through an email, he has has no control. Right. Kenny, do you agree with that? Well, I'm Italian-American. And most of the times in in this this spicy world, like the I uh, am going to tell your wife – Actually, like it ignites like a roller coaster instead oh, of just, just an ending. Well, what it just happens? goes up and down, right? It's like make up sex and break up sex and bigger arguments. And wait, you're and, saying this is typical to the Italian American culture? I feel like maybe I don't know. Okay, we've all ahead. seen ding, The ding. Sopranos. <laughs> What's that? Said <laughs> ding ding. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Really? Tell yeah. me about this, you guys. Yeah. Well, What's I'm assuming like your your uh, your. Gumas. I forgot it was Gumar. Oh yeah, you had a Gumar. Gumas. This is yeah. the second time I've heard Gumar. What is this? Tell me, well, since you're both That's... Italian Americans, what happens? So, you know, uh, give me an Italian name. Lucia is <laughs> cheating on Giovanni. And what happens when Giovanni finds out that Lucia has been cheating? Well, first of all, the wives never have affairs. That's silly. Oh. Yeah, that's the double oh, that's the double standard that <laughs> she knows of. How black American of me. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So Giovanni is cheating on Lucia. What happens next? Well, it's, it was always traditionally was if Friday nights was for the uh, girlfriends yes, and Saturday right. nights is for the yes. – yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so. keep going because on my first episode, Brad, that's not his real name, talks about that. Mm-hmm. OK. Keep going. OK. Well, it's just uh, – No, I want to hear Italian Americans are passionate, spicy people just yes. in general too. I mean they are. So it – there's a lot of that roller coaster. I, Tell I'll tell you me my, what happens my, in the roller coaster. My great, what are your steps? My great, One, grand, two, three, four. my great grandmother and great grandfather always said, How hard you fight is how much you love each other. Wow. Yeah. I'm assuming verbal arguments only? Um no, I mean I grew up in, in some stuff where it was it was physical towards Yeah. And that was, according to them, an expression of how quote hard you're loving the other person? Is that true, Melissa? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So his job is to make money, take care of his children, and that's it. Everything else is on the wife. Yes. And uh, what else could you possibly want from me? See, I would I would bet that these this this story, they're not Italian. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, but still. But please tell me, one of you two Italian-American people— you said, Kenny, that there are steps in a roller coaster after an affair. What happens to the couple after the affair? It, it Give get, me the four well, steps. Well, it gets, it gets ratcheted up, right? How? So it's more passionate in sexually, and it's, and it's also the fights are more passionate and bigger. 
if someone threatens as the uh, divorcee, she threatened to yes. tell the wife, yes. right? An Italian American is it's not going to just get cut off. It's What's going, to, going get, to happen? It's tell going me to get the ratcheted step. up. The sex is going to get crazier. The sex mm-hmm. between who? The mistress, yeah, and the, the husband. mistress, and and the arguments are going to get bigger. Okay. And it's just going to go on this crazy wave that gets very heavy until someone probably will either – it'll either get really physical. And if he's really smooth, then he'll get the women to go after each other yeah. and he'll stay oh. out of it. Yeah. If oh he's really good. Wow. Now, it's – It's rat- very Jersey Shore. Yeah. <laughs> now, the sex yeah. is ratcheted up for – the it's, husband, like he's kind of quote unquote turned uh, on by the fact and the that mistress. he's in oh, this absolutely. predicament. And the mistress, absolutely. Holy and the crap. mistress, because she wants a res- she, she wants, wants a result. To win. She's saying that she she was going to threaten. So it's all you know. And when you have an entire week to prep, honey, oh, we, you can be good on Friday. Yeah. Oh, like, right. Because the could fantasy on is Friday. on point. The house is clean. The outfits are yes, yes. You have an experience. I want to hear it's it. It's a lifestyle. You know too much. Tell me the story, please. Well, it's a life. That was my grandmother's life. I was I had what to was see life? that on the, the weekends. The grandmother was the guma, my, right? Yes, correct. Wait, what's a guma again? Uh, I thought it's, the, it's the other was, woman. It's oh, the other woman. Okay. I thought that was the situation. So at that point, women, I mean, shoot. In Wait, 1933, women got arrested for wearing pants. You know what sure. I mean? You but, needed a man. Melissa, tell me about this guma experience. What did you witness as a child specifically with your grandmother? So everybody knew that she was the mistress. Unfortunately. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. There's house cleaning on Thursday. There's cooking on Friday morning. Everything else was her prep. The nails, the hair, the thing for him coming over Friday evening. Typically, do these women remain single or do yeah. they have husbands no, as well? No, single. So is it like a lifetime career of being a mistress? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Is- is that side true? chicks. There's a whole racket yeah. in being mm-hmm. a side chick. Yeah, well, what? it's, it's like this... a second wife, essentially. Like, she what? obviously had children with, uh, right? Wait, Sandy and I are like, what? Yes. Did you, have you ever heard of this, Sandy? No. They lived in the same town. Yeah. So in this town, according to you, I am not Italian-American, so I'm asking questions. I'm not making assertions. At this time, back when, you know, we're, we're all here in our 40s, 50s, there were women who were dedicated mistresses. They were identified as such. They were the gu- guma, guma, yeah. and everyone understood. Oh, this woman receives. You don't talk about it. Someone's husband on Friday, but you said they all lived in the same community. This is how. Oh my! God. How spectacular <laughs> this is! I oh my saw, gosh! I saw. I can't remember if it was a James Bond film, but either way, it was a woman walking in on her husband with curlers in her hair in bed with someone else. And mm-hmm. he gets out of bed and he's like, hey, sweetie, what's going on? And she's like, how dare you? How could you do this to me? Yeah. He goes, are you OK? And as he's gaslighting the crap out of her, this other woman is getting out of bed, getting dressed and leaving the room. And he's like, do you need to talk to somebody? Are you all right? Are you seeing things? Oh, you don't talk about it. There's nothing to talk about. You smoke screen the crap out of your wife. You're like, yeah, I'm going to play cards with the guys on Friday. But when the wife in curlers actually sees him in bed, you're mm-hmm. saying that he's gaslighting her, telling her we were just yeah, giving each other like, relax. Massages. And then you start questioning yourself as the right. wife. Like, am I nuts? Oh, my God. Sandy, how do you respond to this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really tragic, right? I mean, it's Have almost more tragic before? than just having a one-off affair. It was a cultural thing. Does and it, it was, still exist? Uh, not as much, no. There are men who travel for work that have other families in different states. Yes. I mean, it's not super common, but no, it happens. It's yes, not, I it's know not that. as the traditional kind of Italian mafioso kind of right, thing. Right. You're telling me this is all in the same community. Oh, my God. Um, Doug talks about deleting Angela, his first mistress from his ledger of sins. Doug had an affair with Angela when he and his wife were going through difficult times with their son. Have any of you contemplated the escape of an affair as the way to handle problems in your own partnership, Sandy? No, because I still hold to the fact that I that affairs to me and from people that I know in my life who have had affairs come by a whoopsie. Okay, you were married. You never and you got divorced. You never during that time thought, you know what, let me just have an affair, stick this out. Never once. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Melissa, hmm. you have to be honest. Yes. In your relationships, have yeah. you ever thought, you know what, that guy, he's looking mighty delicious and fine. So because of my background in 
lack of integrity of the people that I grew up around, I can't even have casual sexual relationships. I never could. I was we were either seriously dating or we were nothing. And that was it. I just have really hard boundaries on liking f- girlfriends, husbands, Facebook posts. I'm like, no, no, I don't do that. Really? Really. Like really clear boundaries on what is unacceptable to me. And how do you do that in today's culture? I respect other people's relationships. So let's just say someone from my past or a very – let's just say this guy who checks all of my boxes. Okay. Would you mean like, you like to him. start? Yes, I mean just like whatever it is, right? I'm attracted, um, whatever. Right, whatever all the, the qualities are. that you could foresee in a partner. Correct. Now, okay. if he knows, if he sees my wedding ring, right, and he comes over to me and tries to have a conversation with me, he's already lost. So let's Wait, just say a conversation. A conversation. Come on, shame on you, sir. Get for your life together. A conversation? No, I'm talking about like, uh, hey, do you think maybe can I get your number? Can I? Oh, that he's kind flirting. of con- yes. Okay. That to me, I'm like, <laughs> even if I were single, na- like in the future, you would never be on the list. Okay. Tell me about the line of the boundary because you said conversation. I was like, wait a minute. Oh, no, no, people no, can't no, talk to you because you're married. Absolutely not. Tell me specifically what constitutes that boundary. Can you get a text from a guy saying, hey, I'm having a party. Do you and your husband want to come? Like, what are the things that so I pursue, cannot be done? In, in my personal relationship, right. I pursue a relationship with my husband's friends, girlfriends, wives. That's, that's my job is to pursue that connection. Okay. My job is not to form a connection with my husband's friends. That's not my job. How do you avoid that? Because in today's world, everybody's texting everybody, DMing so it's, anybody. It's completely acceptable to have like normal exchange niceties. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. And that's that's basically it. I'm not trying to avoid conversation. I have no problem having a conversation. But like Doug, I don't want to have a conversation about you and how your girlfriend and the sex and the like, mm-hmm. bro, get a therapist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's inappropriate. You are with your husband and your friends and everybody's going from location A to location B. Mm -hmm. You could get a ride from your girlfriend's husband. Would you get in the car? Um, I guess it would depend on how long I knew them, but probably not. I just take my own car. You can't. Your car is at the shop. Call an Uber. I just I don't. The Ubers are booked. Get out of here. There's no way. There's always a solution. There's always a solution. I'm trying to get at. Would you just avoid at all costs that type of a situation? I just don't think it would come up. Kenny, can you say something to Melissa? My husband my husband's friends my husband's friends wait outside if he's not home. They wait outside come on. home. Okay. I'm dead so, serious. So let's make it so let's have it i I'm gonna bring it back to personal and let's have it a little bit more creative. So just what you said, social media, right? Facebook yeah. came about. I had three young children. A friend of mine reached out to me from childhood. Oh, go figure. I've been living in LA and a I guy friend. Yes. Okay. From high school. Mm-hmm. I had been living in L.A. and all of a sudden, go figure, I'm living in Rye now. Mm. Now, I happened to somehow on social media, he found out that I was living in Rye. Let me interject. So without disclosing who you are and where you live, mm-hmm. that's close to where you live. This Rye place is close to you. Uh, correct. Okay. Correct. Mm-hmm. So I don't really respond. Anyway, so maybe a month or so later, he says we should catch up. Long story short, it gets to a point where he's kind of annoying me. How is and he I, annoying? Well, because it's like I don't necessarily – like we could have a phone conversation. I don't need to meet up with you. I don't need to have drinks with you. I could have a call with so you. So why don't you just tell him that? So I do. So I said, well, why don't you call? So he he has a call with me and then he says, you know, I could definitely meet up with you for drinks. And mm. my eldest child, mm. who is my daughter, mm. says, you know what? I kind of look like you did when you knew him when you were 16. Why don't I just go meet him? No. <laughs> so so oh, I have I, been in a situation where this happened. Did she and, go meet him? Yes. Yeah. It, was, it became a, It became a joke. But my point is no, you what said. what happened? Was he like, are you Sandy? Was it? No, oh. of course not. No. Okay. But it was sort of a funny thing, like a slap in the face. I was like, you know what? You've been doing this for six months. And it took my my brilliant eldest daughter to say, you know, we can put a stop to this. I'll just go meet him. Melissa, yes. talk to Sandy. Do you blame her for even engaging with this guy? Not at all. Okay. Not, not at all. I just, uh, well, it, it, hap- it happens so casually. It happens so, I mean, you don't even think about it. You're just like, right. oh, I remember. He's such a great 
guy, but, right, it's but like, according to you, shouldn't she should he's married the guy, right? Yeah, we both so were. So according to you, oh, you're both were. According to you, should they have even been DMing and I cannot put, I cannot put my boundaries I'm on other you people about what you think about Sandy. No, listen. <laughs> I I I can't. No. I'm it's good. It's all good because it worked out. Right, you guys. Oh, he you're got shying his connection. away, Melissa. You he know you're. <laughs> you don't. You don't agree with what Sandy did. The person that I'm in a relationship with, if yeah. they did that, there'd be a problem. Okay. Ooh. What would the pro- What would you do? What would I do? Yeah. Um. Communicate. I'm not down with it. If you want to do it, that's on you. But you don't get. What me. do you mean that's on you? And they're like, okay, I'm just going to keep I, doing it. I do not believe that people should be made to do anything they don't want to do. Okay, if, so if I had a husband who wanted many fans, because that's basically what it is. Okay, you if you want fans, please have all the fans you want. You just don't get me. You'd leave. Absolutely. Do you have kids? Yes. You pick up your kids and leave. Yeah. You're not afraid. That's a hard boundary for me. Okay. Okay. Melissa, you seem to have very definitive opinions and be very knowledgeable about emotions and expressions and how people interrelate. Where does this come from? I'm actually scared to say it. I've never said it out loud before. So I'm an intuitive psychic medium who also helps people get the um, chemicals out of their home. You're an intuitive psychic medium. I am. So people come to you to say, what's going on? What's my future going to be? And you go to their homes, you tell them, and then you cleanse the air? So what I do is I help women become more mi- more mindful of their toxic load every day. Because I think what it does is it impairs... Um, but how do you do that? So you're psychic, so you have a feeling right now about me or whomever else is in the room. Sure. And then you could come to my home and say, I'm going to help you rid yourself of this toxicity in yourself and in the home. If you are open and available for change, mm-hmm. I can help you do that. With products and with um, my services. Wow. But you know, because you're a psychic medium, whether or not your husband's (laughs) having an affair. You don't even have to investigate. Not necessarily true. I feel very confident in reading other people. Okay. But with myself, it has been a process. Would you tell your clients, your psychic clients, if their partner was having an affair? So usually when they ask the question, it's a problem. Well, do you tell them? Of course. Okay. So that's the answer to the question. You would tell. (laughs) So in the time that I had experienced it, it was she knew already that it was going down. And I attended an event and I was not about to come up to her and be like, hey, listen, he's a dog. Right. Run. She already knew. Right. I believe that, too. The people already know. Yeah. Does love conquer all? Oftentimes I hear guests and interviewees talk about how Love drives us to accept hurtful or degrading situations and behaviors. What part of moving forward after an affair is love versus dutiful acceptance? Do you move forward because you love someone or do you move forward because you're in acceptance of how they behave and what they do? Well, I guess it's case by case, right? But I mean, if if you're accepting that that's part of the person's nature, that they are flawed, which we all are, like... Melissa is not going to accept it or or is, mm-hmm. right? That's what you're willing to accept. Mm-hmm. If, you, mm-hmm. if you're not willing to accept that, that flaw in that person, you keep it moving. But my but, question is about love. Mm-hmm. I hear on this program people talk about love. I did it for love. Well, I loved him. Well, he loved me. L- love, is like, is, there's, love is like one of those things you can't even define. At Berkeley, that was like our psychology course was like define love. And you can't. You really – you can't. It's so – individualized to different people. You know what I mean? It's it's a sensation. That... Well, whether you call it love or the sensation, does it make you more capable? Is it this deep sensation oh, that we have? capable of is overlooking it... some things? Yes. Does it make well, you it definitely, over... yeah, yeah, it definitely makes you more capable of overlooking many things and not just cheating. It could be it could be anything from mm. your spouse's cooking <laughs> to, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. To, to, you know, the way they speak to a lot of different things. But, you know, Cheating is just an, another one of those imperfections in people and, and whether or not you're willing to deal with it. Like in this case, the, it seemed like the wife was willing to deal with it right. in exchange for the lifestyle that she had. Sandy. And, and, oh, excuse me. No, and, and whatever uh, emotional support she was receiving for her husband. Sandy, love, does it conquer all? Is it the reason why we endure all types of situations, including affairs in our relationships? 
Yeah, I have a hard time with love also, just like Kenny in terms of its definition. I think that I love my children mm-hmm. more than probably myself at times. Mm-hmm. I did love my ex-husband, but I think that when you're talking about affairs, more times than not, you're it's like a big crush. And did this woman go back to her husband cuz she loves him? Mm. She may love him, but she loves their life. She loves the lifestyle. She loves her children. She loves the 26 years with him. She's It's comfortable. A quick one on that, Melissa, and then I want to get to my last question. No. She doesn't love him. Um, love doesn't conquer all. No. 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 I truly believe that... Um, Cheating is a form of abuse, emotional abuse. And I feel like in staying, it will eventually erode your self-esteem. Mm. It'll erode your self-worth. Um, it will start to consume your mind as far as where they are, what they're doing. You become this conspiracy theorist. You become this private eye. You become this investigator. You become this power hungry person that's trying to compete with their potential other person. It just, no. So if the couple, for example, goes to therapy and they, quote unquote, resolve it, you still don't think that the betrayed partner can really snap back. But do you see a future for people that have been in adulterous relationships and have resolved their issues? No. No way. Not with therapy? Never. No way. I mean, sure, be comfortably uncomfortable. You obviously haven't been hurt enough yet. Oof. Well, I appreciate how definitive you are. The friend in the story does a lot of listening, but she doesn't really offer her point of view. She doesn't criticize Doug. She doesn't encourage the friend to stay. She just listens. What should we do as friends? How much advice giving or involvement should a friend have in a couple in their marriage or their partnership? Would you give advice or would you stay out of it? She was the worst person in the whole story. Thank you. (laughs) Really? Why? Yeah, well, not necessarily about giving advice or not, but she was definitely rooting for her friend to fail. That's why she kept (gasps) counting all the mistakes. Oh. She kept, I mean, she was weighing herself by how perfect she was by this other person when you really should just be working on yourself. It's not about like how you stack up next to your friend, right? It's about how you stack up as yourself, you being the best version of yourself, which I don't know, I guess is having toilet paper. (laughs) (laughs) So you thought that she had a dubious personality. What would you have wanted the friend to do? Well, it's not about, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily about the friend weighing in on the situation or not. Like, cause if the person is legitimately okay with whatever, or doesn't want to talk about it, you're not supposed to force your agenda on the, on the person. What would you do if somebody came to you? Would you give them advice? Would you stay out of it? What should you do? You find If they out- were asking for my advice, I'd give them advice. Okay. If, if they're not asking for my advice, I would just try and be there to listen. But I also wouldn't be checking things off like, ah, oh, she didn't get the Bellinis. She's not that perfect. And now she's being cheated on and her life's not that perfect. Oh, you think she was competitive. Oh, definitely. Well, now, why would she count? Why was she keeping tally? Oh, God. Melissa, you you agree. You think that that was the worst character in the story. Honestly, that to me indicated that she has um, self-worth issues. Um, Who's she? The wife that got cheated on. Okay. Because I'm like, not only have you decided that a man who cheats on you is good enough, but also you have friends that are keeping track of your shortcomings during your time of need. But those weren't shortcomings. Those were... Oopsies. High Those comes. are oopsies. No, but the friend was saying she's perfect. She's amazing. She's everything. She seemed like um, a pretentious, insidious individual that I wouldn't surround myself with. Okay. Do you agree with that, Sandy? Uh, no, I, t- I don't really. I think that um, that the reason that the friend was taking – Stock. To taking stock was more the writer's way of sort of inflating how perfect Mm -hmm. this wife was Mm -hmm. so that she was – it was more of a descriptive – like a a way of developing the character of the wife than Mm -hmm. to really be – I didn't really think much of the friend 
except that I do know personally that it's very, very difficult to to see your best friends and their significant others and make a judgment call that's accurate. I had a situation in the recent past where a woman that I was friends with, we were both friends. We knew that her husband was cheating on her. We had a laundry list of data and we had a conversation. Do we tell her? Do we not? Do we tell her? Do we not? The other woman was much better friends with the wife than I. I was like, I'm not saying anything. Mm, Well, no, that, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure that I would do it that way, but that's, that's a personal thing. No, I'm just saying for my three closest, nearest and dearest women friends from childhood, Mm -hmm. their significant others, I've had issues with each and every one of them. They've had affairs. No, no, no. Oh. They've had different, uh, just in terms of just a general blanket statement of how their relationships are. Okay. And from the outside and from my best friend's uh, friendship with me, I have been wrong every time. If there's three of, if there, say there's three of them, mm-hmm. and I've said this marriage is going to last, this isn't, this marriage is going to end in divorce, this, that marriage is going to end in an affair, I've been wrong ev- in all three cases. So you're saying you don't know and you can't judge, therefore you should stay out of it. Uh, no, if it's something critical, I wouldn't. And if I was asked, like Kenny well, that's says my their question. opinion. Well, that's my question is I'm asking the three of you, Melissa, Kenny, and Sandy, would you tell if you knew that someone close to you, their partner was having an affair? When I've been put in this situation, I have not. Kenny? I've never really been put in that situation, but I, I guess it would be a case by case thing because I would have to. What are you inclined to do? <clears throat> probably not say anything. Why? Uh, because it's really not my business. If there was someone, if I knew the person would be super, super affected by it and really upset by it, then I probably would tell them. Mm-hmm. If I don't know their situation, like like uh, Melissa said, they could be in an open relationship for all I know. I'm mm-hmm. not going to just start intervening on what the boundaries and the structure of their relationship is Mm. and what constitutes cheating. To one person, cheating can be just flirtation. Well, no, I'm talking about if they were sleeping together. Yeah, but again, like, I don't know. For all I know, like, they're they're in an open relationship. If I I knew that the person was going to be hurt, right? If I was sitting next to you and and I knew that your, your partner was cheating and you would be ultra- deceived and hurt by it, then I probably might tell you if it was someone else who I didn't know, like the inner workings of their relationship and they were, I wouldn't say anything. That's so interesting that you'd be willing to tell me, even though you know, I'd be hurt because you'd think it was in my best interest because I'm really invested. If I, if I knew it was definitely in your best interest, like I said, I would have to know the person well, very, very well. Sandy, you get the last word. Would you tell? Um, I've never actually, like Kenny, I think it's circumstance to circumstance, but I did have an incident years ago with a friend who was convinced her husband was having an affair. And she said, will you come with me and try and follow him? And Mm. we spent many a night trying to follow him. You did? And what'd you find out? We never, you know, it never really materialized materialized anything. And then she moved out of town and she's still with him. But it it was her really asking me to partner in this endeavor. It wasn't as if I knew for sure. Right. Interesting. Thank you all so much. What an interesting conversation with different perspectives. Um, As always, I know that this conversation is going to help someone. Someone out there is listening, doesn't know what to do, doesn't know how to proceed, whether they be the friend, whether they be the cheater, whether they be the betrayed lover. Somebody has been greatly affected by your words. And I thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Jillian. Yeah, thanks, Jillian. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much to all the listeners. I really appreciate it when you share the podcast, like, and most of all, leave comments. Please do it because the star ratings really, really help me. And I'd love to hear from you.